Uh, very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode three hundred and eleven, which is back to basics to uh, module two, and it's a pleasure to have Dr. Kostu Mille again with us today uh, from Center for Site Hyderabad, talking to us on essentials of ophthalmic pathology part two, and hopefully some more trivia about the Ironman events. Uh, for those of you who missed the last lecture, a uh, brief introduction for sir. He has done his MBBS from Kim's Garar and uh, MD Pathology and Senior Residency in Anatomical Pathology and Cytology from Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. He went on to do his Oncopathology training in Bangalore Institute of Oncology, Bangalore and Ophthalmic Pathology training from the prestigious L.B. Prasad I Institute, Hyderabad. Currently, he heads the National Reporting Center for Ophthalmic Pathology at Center for Site, Hyderabad. And he has several publications in peer reviewed journal, journals and many presentations and posters to his credit at both national and international levels. Major awards and honors include Gangadhar Sundar Gold Medal, SC Datta Award at AIOS, G. Subalakshmi Gold Medal for the Young Scientist, and several other Best Paper Awards at the AIOS and AIPM meetings. He's a fitness enthusiast, a triathlete who has raced his way to the finish line at six 70.3 Ironman events in Asia, Europe, and Australia. Pleasure to have you with us again today, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Chef Ali, for a wonderful introduction again. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, very good evening, everyone. Uh, so we tried to cover some basics of pathology uh, day before yesterday. And as promised, we are going to discuss some interesting cases today. And I would like to have you participate, try to answer some questions. They are not very difficult, nothing hardcore pathology. So even if it is a clinical part, just jump in with your inputs. Let's make it interactive. Okay. Yes. Okay, let's go to case one. Uh, this was a middle-aged female who presented with redness, watering for about, of about six months duration. So based on this clinical picture, uh, does anyone want to come up with a diagnosis? So it looks like an infective corneal ulcer likely to be fungal. Okay, very good. Now the patient, uh, the visual acuity, I mean patient, uh, it was HM positive, PL positive. Uh, the anterior chamber was hazy. Pupil was dilated and fixed in the affected eye. There was a ring-shaped ulcer and um, a stro a stromal infiltrates. So like Subhav said, yes, possibly fungal. So basically infective etiology. So a therapeutic keratoplasty was done. And this is what the cornea look like. So if you look at the picture over here, at the bottom, you see a black pigmented structure over there. So that's the adherent iris. So iris was adherent to the posterior corneal surface. And then this part that you see over here, that's the decimates membrane. So uh, goes unsaid that this part of the cornea is the posterior cornea. This is the anterior cornea. And you see there's no epithelium, no Bowman's membrane. So definitely there's ulceration. And all this blue activity that you see over here in the anterior half, it's all a neutrophilic infiltrate. So there's acute keratitis in the anterior uh, cornea. So now when we talk about infiltrates in the cornea, uh, the infiltrates can be anterior, they can be posterior, or they can be full thickness. So does anyone want to tell me which are those organisms that cause anterior corneal infiltrate? So this is a higher picture which shows the neutrophilic infiltrate. So which organisms cause posterior infiltrates and which ones cause full thickness infiltrates? Type in your answers. Okay. So as I told you yesterday, any corneal biopsy that is sent to the lab, there are certain stains that we definitely do. One is a PAS, periodic acid skiff. The second is a GMS. Both of these are for fungal infections. Then we do a gram stain. Gram stain is basically for bacterial infection. It can even identify fungi. And then we do a ZN staining. ZN staining for uh, nocardia, 
ZN staining for microsporidia and ZN staining for tuberculosis. So all these were done. Now this is another picture from the same corneal biopsy, a higher magnification. What do we see over here? Can you see these egg-like things over here? Yes. Yes. This is another picture. Again, you see those egg-like things and these are all neutrophils. There's a lot of cellular debris over here. And we, when we did a GMS staining, these egg-like structures took up the stain. So they were GMS positive. So now what's the diagnosis? What could those egg-like things be? If you look at them carefully, don't they look like cysts with some material inside? So they are basically cysts. Yeah. Which organism causes has cysts? Acanthamoeba. Correct. Acanthamoeba. So this was a case of acanthamoebic keratitis. Now, there's another stain which can be done on scrapings to identify acanthamoeba. What is that stain? I'm showing you a picture right over here. What is it? Lactophenol cotton blue. Um, well, yes, but this is not what it is. Tell me, the tell me the technique and then tell me the stain. So basically, this is a picture which shows immunofluorescence. So you use calcofluor white and it highlights the acanthamoeba. So this is a picture of immunofluorescence staining. Okay, let's go to the next one. This was a 72-year-old gentleman who presented with this upper pedunculated upper eyelid mass, which was reddish, ulcerated. There was a black, it, it had a blackish surface. On further examination, he had these multiple reddish nodules all over the face, even on the neck, if I can see, and then also on the abdomen. Some of them had a hemorrhagic surface also. So based on this picture, does anyone want to come up with a diagnosis? So basically you have an eyelid lesion, and then there are multiple such lesions all over the body. Elderly gentleman. Sir, nodular ulcerative lesion, uh, important to rule out a squamous cell carcinoma. Very good. Squamous cell carcinoma. Yes, that's on the top of the list. Anything else? The second diagnosis that was thought of was a Kaposi sarcoma. Systemic with metastasis, of course. So considering these two diagnoses, a biopsy was done. This we have already discussed. So this is what the biopsy looked like. Now, if you look at the top picture on your top left, you know, this is the epithelium. These are normal sebaceous glands and hair follicles. Whereas here you see glands. So these are pro probably uh, sweat glands, lacrimal glands, whatever. And then the tumor is mainly in the dermis. This is another picture from a different area which shows the tumor reaching up to the epidermis. So it's a very cellular tumor. It doesn't have a, any striking pattern. Can't see keratin voles over here. So I'm not going to think of a uh, squamous cell carcinoma right away. If at all, it is probably a poorly differentiated one. Now this is a higher picture, higher magnification where you can see a lot of epithelioid cells. Epithelioid cells, in a sense, they may be epithelial, they may not be epithelial, but they look epithelium-like, epithelial cells-like. And if you look at their nuclei, each nucleus is different from the other, from in size, shape, everything. So this is what we pathologists call it as nuclear atypia. Now, nuclear atypia is graded from mild to severe. Now, here what you can see is there's a lot of difference between the nuclei. So this is definitely severe nuclear atypia, very typical of a high-grade tumor. Whichever tumor it is, it's a high-grade tumor. That's another picture which shows the same thing, epithelioid cells. They are non-cohesive. There's no keratin. They are poorly differentiated. So when we look, when we talk about a poorly differentiated tumor involving the skin, like Subhav, you said, we can think of a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. We can think of a basal cell carcinoma, probably a basosquamous carcinoma, if at all. And the other thing that we can think of either is a metastasis or a amelanotic melanoma. Amelanotic melanoma is always in the differential diagnosis of a poorly differentiated malignancy. This is another picture which shows, what does it show? There's a blood vessel and there's a tumor sitting inside it. 
So they are emboli. That probably explains why you have the same nodules all over the body. Probably there's lymphovascular tumor spread. So lymphovascular tumor spread is uh, classical of which category of tumors? Epithelial or mesenchyma? Okay, homework. Okay, so we did, a, we did a panel of immunohistochemistry out of which S100 and HMB45 were strongly positive. Now, these are markers for melanoma, melanocytes. So this was a case of amelanotic melanoma. Now, we went ahead and we screened the patient. The patient had a heel ulcer. Very typical uh, presentation of a melanoma. So this was probably the primary lesion from where the tumor went on and spread all over the body. He had even multiple uh, lung nodules. The patient passed away in a few days, but this was a case of melanoma. Okay, trivia time. No Iron Man questions. This is a famous location. Yes. So where is it? Goa. What is it called? That I don't remember. <laughs> Tapora Fort in Goa. Ah. Okay. Okay, let's get on to the next case. Now, uh, this was a young adult, say somewhere around 25 years old, <coughs> presented with this lesion on his left eye. What do you think it is? Uveal melanoma with the extraocular extension. Okay. Anything else? Can so, Subha thinks it is malignant. Does anyone here think it is not malignant? The first thing we should keep in mind is that, but uh, it can be a staphyloma. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me show you a slit lamp picture. See these yellowish nodules out here? So what looks yellowish? There's fat, which can look yellow. There's any xanthomatous lesion that can look yellow. Correct? Yes. Other than that? Um, blood which is getting... Um, yeah, blood which is getting... Uh, okay. Absorbed. Mm. Fine. A biopsy was done. And this is what it looked like. So this is a low power view. This is the conjunctival epithelium if you see. And then you have these round structures over here sitting in the epithelium. Probably in the follicular epithelium. And then you have multiple small round things over here. It's, it's like all over the substantia propria. Let me show you a higher magnification. That's another view. Same things. You have those rounded cyst-like structures and there's a lot of pink eosinophilic structures within that cyst-like structure. There's a higher view, higher magnification. And there's another one. Now what? So definitely we have excluded a malignancy over here. Doesn't look malignant. There's no tumor will have this appearance. So these are basically what we call sporangia. And these small things inside it are sporangiospores of rhinosporidia. So this was a case of rhinosporidiosis. So what causes rhinosporidiosis? Which organism? Rhinosporidium? What? Seabury. Microbiology. Yeah. Is it a fungus or is it a protozoan? Protozoan. Yeah, it was initially thought to be a fungus, but it is actually a protozoan. Okay. So this was a case of conjunctival rhinosporidiosis. What's the treatment? Okay, homework again. Okay, let's get on to the next case. This was a 65-year-old. Okay, Shefali, you're gonna like this case. Hmm. This was a 65-year-old lady who had initially had presented somewhere else with the upper eyelid swelling, which, which was thought about to be a chronic sialadenitis. That swelling was excised. Some pathologists reported it as chronic dacryoadenitis. Right? So that's it. That's about it. 
now you're smiling so you probably know the answer <laughs> okay so don't don't answer then if you have already known it don't answer okay now about 3 to 4 months later she presented to us with a burning sensation in the operated eye and some kind of stickiness on examination there was proptosis severe dry eye which is explainable because the lacrimal gland was removed and there was extraocular muscle restriction now i you know like always sir passed on the slide to me i reviewed it classical dacryoadenitis nothing unusual about it you see this lacrimal acini and all that blue thing over there is a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate so chronic dacryoadenitis no evidence of lymphoma no infection nothing so these are the ct scan pictures when the patient visited us not the initial ones what do you think it is anyone who's watching the program wants to comment please comment okay what's this it's a very diffuse heterogeneous mass in the orbit correct nowhere close to the lacrimal gland agree okay now what so we thought it could probably be something it was probably something else initially and that has recurred which is probably missed earlier but then the slides were seen we took multiple sections there was nothing so sir thought of doing a frozen section just to be sure that we are not dealing with a malignancy Now that's a higher uh, closer view of the same uh, lesion okay so when the first section came out frozen section came out it was the same thing there was a lot of fibrosis a lot of inflammation those bluish nodules that you see they are all lymphoid nodules this is germinal center in in a germinal center over here and this pink thing all you see in the background is all fibrosis so chronic fibro inflammatory process so sir was very certain that you know ki no it cannot be this so he went deeper when he went deeper this is what we saw a lot of more fibrosis less inflammation but again inflammation nonetheless he said no let's go deeper we went deeper then we saw these multinucleate giant cells over here lot of multinucleate giant cells so when you see multinucleate giant cells but uh, you know we can think about some infective etiology probably fungal probably tubercular but then there were no granulomas it was just multinucleate giant cells some other views showed this these are these multinucleate giant cells and can you see these things these are very refractile elements in some cases which are even engulfed by these multinucleate giant cells so certainly this was a foreign body this is what we found later on it was a gauze piece that was left behind from the previous surgery so this was a case of what we call as gauze pipe Mm-hmm. what does gauze pipeoma mean gauze pipeoma gauze pm stands for basically cotton cotton so the other name for this lesion is also textiloma textile yeah this is a mass formed from a textile material so textiloma okay trivia time bollywood movie which location very famous bo- bollywood movie from my college days any other hint sir okay <laughs> scotland remember this ah tum pass i kuch kuch hota hai yes so that's glenco in scotland okay let's get on to the next case now uh, this was a 35 year old african male who had come with a thysical left eye and already known but he came he presented to us with diminution in vision in the right eye that's what his complaint was he did not come for the left eye he came for the right eye now this is the scan which showed a mass in the choroid uh, shefali subhav ruju please correct me if i'm going wrong anywhere there's a mass in the choroid moderate to high reflectivity so what do you think of so adult male we went through this day before yesterday adult male choroidal mass yeah. his systemic examination was all normal sorry it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't performed till yet, performed till here 
so we didn't know anything about his systemic condition other than that that he had diminution of vision and then this picture so the first thing that comes to mind is obviously a melanoma right so a new nucleation was performed and this is what the mass look like now if you see over here this is the choroid right so the mass is nowhere close to the choroid it's actually in the vitreous probably involving the retina you see this is all the vitreous fluid and then this is the mass this going this is in the optic nerve it doesn't look like it's going in the optic nerve so a very non pigmented solid fleshy appearing mass and these are probably some cystic areas that you see over here very translucent types this is the cut surface so you see a mass which has got a variegated appearance lot of cysts lot of solid material solid fleshy material and then you have some hemorrhage also inside so what do you think it is any possible diagnosis a melanotic melanoma no that also has to arise from the choroid okay which is the other intraocular tumor that we can get lymphoma lymphoma yes but then lymphoma usually isn't cystic it's it got a very fleshy appearance yes but it isn't usually cystic so when such a thing comes to a pathologist attention the first thing that we think of is metastasis hmm. so when we did the light microscopy you can see lot of glandular structures over here can you see the cysts so these are lot of glands and then you have some solid areas also see these glands now if you look at these glands if you look at the inner surface the lining cells it has got a very fuzzy border can you see it something like snouts coming out into the lumen let me show you a higher magnification can you see this a lot of snouts so basically it was a adenocarcinoma now adenocarcinoma intraocular what are the likely possibilities where do you think it can come from lungs okay intestinal the yeah, retinal artery adenocarcinoma no retinal to nahi hoga no why not it has to be the glands no A retina will not hold okay but then it's still called adenocarcinoma isn't it or adenocarcinoma for a reason it does have glands okay but this doesn't look very typical of a rp so we call it a metastatic adenocarcinoma and we did a further ihc workup now when we did all those uh, antibodies two things that came positive was cd10 and pax8 now these are very typically positive in renal cell tumors renal cell carcinoma especially so when we did the pet scan this is what we found and then this is the partial nephrectomy that was done and there's a tumor sitting right over here mm -hmm. so this was a case of rcc metastatic to the eye okay mm, forget this okay let's look at this lady ruju knows about this case so okay now uh, this was a 65 year old lady who presented with diplopia that was her only complaint right so on examination there was muscle ex ex eom restriction in all gazes that's the diplopia charting we did a ct scan which showed this so there's a thickened lateral rectus lateral rectus right yes yes okay yes. so there's a thickened lateral rectus now what what do you think it is there is a axial proptosis with the, also thickening of the lateral rectus muscle so okay. probably rule out cystic sarcosis one to rule okay. out uh, um, in this age group ladies can also think of lymphoma extraocular okay. muscle lymphoma okay intramuscular lymphoma okay fine so like subho and you said these are the two common possibilities so a biopsy was done okay this is a mri again showing the same thing thickening of but if you see look at the picture on the right side 
Ruju told me that there's thickening of all extra, all recti. Mm-hmm. So does cystic cirrhosis affect all muscles typically? No. No. So I think we can exclude mm-hmm. cystic cirrhosis over here. So now what's left is probably a lymphoma. But then lymphoma will not affect only the muscles, will it? So biopsy was done. Uh, this is what we saw. We saw these very epithelioid cells and these cell, and then there's a lot of fibrosis. Okay, this pink thing that you see is fibrosis. And these are all epithelial cells. They look like tumor cells. And they have a very typical pattern. Can you see they are all in a straight line? If, even if here, if you see, they're all in one straight line. So this pattern, we pathologists call it as an Indian file pattern. You know, it resembles those Ind- Indian soldiers going out for combat mm. or war. So there's one cancer in the body which has a very, which typically has this Indian file pattern, and that is lobular carcinoma of the breast. Indian file pattern. The first thing that comes to our mind is a lobular carcinoma of breast. So we did an ERPR. Both were positive, and this patient had a breast primary. So this was a case of a look at this. That's mm. the PET scan. Mm. This was a case of a metastatic breast carcinoma. Okay, trivia time again. One more picture. Again, Bollywood movie. So I am a Yes Chopra fan. Okay, mm. and I am a Shahrukh Khan fan. So it has to be one of that movie. This is uh, that one. I'm sure you have been here, Shafali. <laughs> no. I mean, I'm not here, but this country. Uh, this probably is that one. Rani Mukherjee, Shah Rukh Khan. Which movie was that? No. No? Okay. Okay, this is again Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Does it remind you of this? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so this yeah. is a place called Sanen in Switzerland. Again, DDLJ. Okay. Now, this was a 40-year-old male who presented with, you can see a subbrow swelling in the, on the right side. And it has a very reddish appearance, so probably inflamed. That's another picture. And this was here for about four months duration. So based on the history that I have given, is there any diagnosis that you would want to come up with? Four months. Yes, four months. First it did is- not. It did not resolve. Not on and off. It was just there. Chronic dacryoadenitis. Okay, chronic dacryoadenitis. That's one possibility. Anything else? Even NSOID, which okay, is NSOID. NSOID. But will NSOID have this kind of inflammation? I mean, on the skin. Anterior NSOID, sir. It can. Okay. Um. Any acute infective etiology? Could that be a possibility? Hmm. But okay. four months. Uh, ah, yeah, four months. Yeah. Maybe an abscess or something? Settle down into an abscess? Maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. So that's a CT scan. Mm-hmm. Now what? So that's this mass. Probably cystic also, isn't it? Uh, inflamed dermoid, like dermoid which has burst. Yes, so inflamed dermoid, yes, that, that is what the surgeon also felt it was after looking at the scan, of course, and was excised. So this is what the cut, cut section of the mass looked like. So again, what we saw on the scan, it was typically cystic. It got a thick wall. Um, but unlike a dermoid, there was no pultaceous material in it. It was mostly this uh, liquefied material inside. So under the microscope, this is what I saw. A lot of inflammation. This all that you see over here is a lot of inflammation. This pink thing that you see is all the fluid that we saw on the gross, gross picture. And then you had this structures over here, multiple structures. That's a higher magnification view. Again, a lot of inflammation. So an abscess, this liquid material, probably some exudate. And then you have these structures. So this structure is like we saw in the earlier case of rhinosporidiosis. When you see the structures, we usually think about a parasite. Mm. That's a higher magnification. So if you look at this parasite, it has got a thick 
cuticle then it has got these two bags and which has got these egg like structures inside so this is the uterus of the worm and those are those eggs so this what is it yeah see this the higher magnification view of those kids <laughs> this is a case of onchocerciariasis mm -hmm. so onchocerciasis onchocerciaria is basically what is the other name for onchocerciariasis uh, river blindness yes river blindness it is transmitted to the bite of black fly very endemic in brazil and even uh, india and sri lanka mm -hmm. okay so this was a peripheral smear which showed this microphyll area see this as the microphyll area so case of onchocerciariasis okay next case i think i showed you this picture yesterday this was okay we i think you you all know this case so you know just give out the answers this is a very recent case so this was a 19 year old female who i think the history is a giveaway who presented with diminution of vision over the past 3 months see those very tortuous and dilated episcleral vessels yeah subha so, what is it this is a transluminant photograph showing a yes. pinkish mass uh -huh. rising from the ciliary body like angle is involved and also involving the pupillary plane this is yes. a the... so like you said this is a pinkish mass which is pushing the iris correct okay now that's a scan which again shows this mass somewhere around the ciliary body angle and this is what the gross picture look like you have this mass over here which looks very fleshy non pigmented and the region is ciliary body so a non pigmented mass in the region of ciliary body what do we think of it could be a melanotic melanoma or a leoma it could be a leomyoma it could be a metastasis so when i look at it it doesn't look like a melanoma because the uvea over it looks pretty intact there's nothing wrong with the uvea uvea over here so it's probably something that is arising from the ciliary body it could be a schwannoma it could be a leomyoma or the unlikely it could be a metastasis so yesterday you were asking me what does leomyoma look like so this is what this leomyoma looks like but the uterine leomyomas look very different now if you see this leomyoma doesn't have any pattern there's a uveal lining over here and that's the tumor a lot of blood vessels over here which are dilated very prominent that's the higher magnification so if you look at the nuclei unlike the melanoma that we saw earlier these nuclei appear very uniform they are each nucleus is very much similar to the one around it a very classical sign of this being a low grade lesion or a benign lesion again a higher magnification you see this very round cells pinkish cytoplasm these are the blood vessels that i was thinking about so again leomyoma is not a histopathological diagnosis so from this i cannot make a diagnosis i would probably call it uh, a epithelioid undifferentiated neoplasm of low malignant potential or a benign undifferentiated neoplasm and then i would do a ihc so okay so when we did the ihc this is what was positive sma which is a very typical marker of smooth muscle cells it's got smooth muscle actin so this was a case of ciliary body leomyoma okay last one spotter k3 yes no not k3 k3g kabhi nahi kabhi 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 no i know that's a favorite movie we have been talking about it but no this is not k3g okay remember this oh no but then no yes so this is long lead in bath uk parampara pratishtha and anushasan yes <laughs> okay now this was 65 year old gentleman who presented with 
can you say baggy eyelids yeah so swollen eyelids the left more than the right and if you look at what is typical in on the left side is there's a yellowish discoloration uh then you see there's proptosis over there ruju do you want to describe the ct scan and then give a possible diagnosis uh probably it's a xanthogranuloma uh, okay so basically it's a bilateral diffuse heterogeneous mass uh again yellowish discoloration so yes you think of xanthogranuloma first so a biopsy was done and this is what we saw so you have these multinucleate giant cells now these are very different from the multinucleate giant cells that we saw earlier in the sense that the nuclei are arranged in a ring like pattern and then there's foamy cytoplasm around it so what are these cells called eutonic giant cells eutonic giant cells and along with this to accompany these there are usually foamy histiocytes these cells that you see over here which has which are similar to eutonic giant cells only thing is that they are uninucleate rather than multinucleate and they are called foamy histiocytes so foamy histiocytes with eutonic giant cells and a chronic inflammatory background very typical of a xanthogranuloma so this was a case of adult onset xanthogranuloma so when we talk about histiocytic lesions which are the histiocytic lesions that can affect the eye this is spectrum right yes so what are those adult onset xanthogranuloma yes adult onset xanthogranuloma asthma associated yes. periox g with asthma no or dime chester disease probiotic and the malignant type what is it मल्टीसिस्टमिक two more cases left do we have time for two yes yes, yes we do okay so this was a young gentleman who presented with this uh so what do you want to describe this picture yes sir um uh, this is a photograph of the mid face showing a um, right eye there is either a total cataract like basically a white reflex in the pupillary zone probably a total right. cataract and also the eye looks thysical because there is a deep superior upper lid sulcus right okay oh this is a fundus picture yes what do we see over here um, subretinal uh, hypopigmented uh, diffuse lesion okay so based on this is there any possibility that you want to come up with any likely possibility of course i am the gold standard but still rodal osteoma okay i'll show you another picture okay that's the scan okay do we see diffuse choroidal thickening over here Yes, we do. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Could it be meds? Yes. No. Rujo is saying no. Diffuse choroidal thickening. We don't have. Okay. So meds will probably have multiple nodules or something. Ah, uh, discrete. Nodules. Okay, discrete nodules. So diffuse choroidal thickening. What could you think of? Hemangioma. Hemangioma. Okay. Yes. even uh, diffuse melanoma of the choroid yes, diffuse melanoma very good yes that could be a possibility and i think in that picture i saw melanocytic lesion lesion this one yeah this one no 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 in the second no, one the no, montage this one okay uh, so pigmentation basically like, uh, i don't know if it's like that lipofuscin orange pigment that we see on the melanoma Correct. yes okay yes oh uh, this is what the eyeball look like This is a peripheral callet. Now, can you see this mass? There's a mass over here, right under the retina. It's basically pushing the retina upwards and causing detachment. And this is what we call 
a okay. funnel shaped detachment of the retina and then you have the mass here also mm -hmm. okay. then there's a mass here also so this like subhav said basically there's diffuse choroidal involvement mm -hmm. now this is the this is what we saw under the microscope see this mass c shaped mm -hmm. mass sitting right under the retina involving the choroid region that's a high magnification so basically it's a very intensely pigmented mass now when we see a pigmented mass see over here i cannot see anything i cannot make out what type of cells are these so what we do i explained to you yesterday what we do when you see melanin pigment yes we do a bleach permanganate bleach and this is what we saw so the pigment was gone so it one it confirms that yes it was melanin and not hemorrhage or hemosiderin and then we saw these very polygonal epithelioid looking cells now this could still be a melanoma but when you go down to the higher microscope higher magnification what we see is that these nuclei if you remember the first case of melanoma that we saw you saw there's nuclear atypia nuclear differed from one another but here the nuclei appear very uniform they look almost similar to each other another thing that you see is the cytoplasm is very foamy very frothy now this is very characteristic of a histiocyte or a macrophage so you have a melanin pigment which was present in the macrophage those macrophages you call melanophages because they have ingested melanin so what is that lesion which you where you, you see melanophages mm -hmm. one it could probably be a melanoma which was necrotic and now is replaced by melanophages but then i did not see any necrosis over here okay right? there's no trace of necrosis there's no trace of any viable melanoma over here so next thing what we do is immunohistochemistry yes immunohistochemistry now to confirm a melanoma which are the two markers that we do i showed you earlier we do a s100 and we do a hmb45 okay does anyone want to come up with a diagnosis now okay hmb45 negative excludes that these are melanocytes but just to be doubly sure i still did a s100 again negative positivity is indicated by brown color so again s100 negative hmb45 negative so it's not melanoma so it confirms that those cells are melano melanocytes melanophages i did a cd1 cd68 which came out to be positive confirming the macrophage nature so what is that lesion pigmented full of melanophages which is smiling she knows the diagnosis okay this was a case of melanocytoma mm. okay so this was a diffuse choroidal melanocytoma okay. okay trivia time last question before we get on to the last case identify the location <laughs> opd room now yes this is this is where our director sits sent of a site okay let's get on to the last case this was a young girl 7 years old who presented with proptosis oh uh, this was the mri so you see what do you see over here it's a thickened optic nerve thickening around the optic nerve and then what is this intracranial yeah intracranial extension so any diagnosis at this stage it can be optic nerve glioma which has gone up to the chiasma That's on correct. that yeah, it's crossing okay. the other side also so, since you have mentioned the optic nerve glioma which is the commonest type of optic nerve glioma what are the types of glioma no chef you don't answer this <laughs> so you have grade 1 to grade grade 4 there are four different types of gliomas grade 1 to grade 4 <coughs> which are grade 1 gliomas homework okay all all four grades of glioma you want to tell me the names tomorrow okay now the specimen was excited this is what it looked like you see the eyeball over here so there is nothing in the eye whatever exists is beyond the eye and around the optic nerve 
So if this specimen was given to you, can you come up with two differential diagnoses for the specimen? One is of course what Shefadi said. It could be optic neglioma. It can still be optic neglioma. Anything else? Something around the optic nerve? Uh, based on the specimens, like it can yes, be based on, just based on the specimen or maybe even the CT scan, but of course CT scan. Yes. There's an intracranial extension. Forget that there's an intracranial extension. Let's look at the specimen. Can be pilocytic gastrocytoma. That's a, again a glioma. No? A glioma only. Okay. Optic nerve sheath meningioma. Yes. So these are the two differential diagnoses: optic nerve sheath meningioma and optic nerve glioma. So this is what the light microscopy showed like showed. It's a very typical case of pilocytic astrocytoma. Right? So this was a case of optic nerve glioma. Pilocytic astrocytoma is grade one glioma. One of the grade one gliomas. Okay. Now, is there any typical molecular abnormality that is associated with the py pilocytic astrocytoma? Any particular gene that is associated, which is prognostically and therapeutically important? Okay, another hint. Also associated with melanoma. And not the same fusion or mutation, but yes, that gene is or that protein is involved. BRAF. Okay. So, in, in pilocytic astrocytoma or optic nerve glioma, you, the BRAF gene either shows a fusion with KIA 1549 or it can show a BRAF V600E mutation. Now, let's not get into the details of it, but these are prognostically important. Is there any other lesion which shows a V600E mutation? Xanthogranuloma. <laughs> okay, that's it for today. Thank you so much, sir. That was very, very interesting. Pleasure. We had like few more other cases which we get on a daily basis to yes. discuss, but maybe for another class. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, let me just okay. share. Oh. Do you have any questions from the social media portal? Uh, yes, Shafari. I'm just listing it out. So uh, one uh, of the viewers have actually carried on the question from last uh, mm -hmm. class as well. Uh, mm -hmm. They would want to know the uh, histopathological features of a pleomorphic adenoma versus a pleomorphic adenocarcinoma. Okay. Uh, now, as the name suggests, let's divide the term into two, two separate terms, pleomorphic and adenoma, pleomorphic and adenocarcinoma. Now, the term pleomorphic for us pathologists means different from each other. So, when the nuclei differ from each other, it's called pleomorphism. They differ in size and shape. That's pleomorphism. It's very typical of a malignancy. But then, what happens in pleomorphic adenoma is that the nuclei vary in size, but their nuclear membranes are very regular. There's no indentation, they are very smooth as opposed to a carcinoma where you get irregularities of the nuclear membrane. So that differentiates a carcinoma from an adenoma. Now in an adenoma, uh, the tumor is characteristically biphasic. Biphasic in the sense it has got two different lines of differentiation. One is an epithelial component and the other is a mesenchymal component. Epithelial component is typically made up of those glands and acini. And then the mesial component is basically the stroma. Now, characteristically, it is either fi fibromyxoid or it is chondromyxoid. But then there can be some variations also. Sometimes you can have adipose metaplasia. Sometimes you can have ost osteoid material. So, but very typically, it's chondromyxoid or fibromyxoid. Now, this is pleomorphic adenoma. When pleomorphic adenoma differentiates or de-differentiates into a malignancy. It is called pleomorphic, adeno pleomorphic adenocarcinoma or mo a more 
apt term is carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma cxpa that's what we call it now the carcinomatous element can be any carcinoma that can involve the lacrimal gland it could be a squamous cell carcinoma it could be a adenocarcinoma it could be a epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma it can even be a adenoid cystic carcinoma so the morphology can vary but malignancy in a carcin in, in a pleomorphic adenoma is cxp so if it is adenoid cystic carcinoma you call it adenoid cystic carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma same way squamous cell carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma now to call it cxpa it is very important that there are two th either of the two things that exist one you have to demonstrate the benign component in the same lesion in the same mass or there should be a history of pleomorphic adenoma that has been excised in the same place only then you can call it a cxpa yes sir uh, moving on to the next question sir uh, how do you differentiate uh, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma in um no. uh, versus a adenocarcinoma okay now mucoepidermoid as the name suggests it has got again it has got three different lines it has a epithelioid component epidermoid basically epithelial uh, so it can be it has got squamous component it has got a epidermoid component and then it has got a glandular component so three different elements that can exist in different proportions based on the proportions there's a certain scoring that is uh, given to these tumors and that is one of the feature which kind of is used in grading the mucoepidermoid carcinomas whereas uh, adenocarcinoma on the other hand will have only the glandular component the squamous component and the epidermoid component will be missing Thank and then the, then then you have a uh, adenosquamous carcinoma also. which will not have the epidermoid component it will have only the squamous component and the glandular component yes sir so uh, the um, one viewer has asked about the dysplasia seen in a case of uh, like uh, whenever we evaluate ocular surface lesions they want to know the difference between a dysplasia versus a carcinoma in situ it was actually explained by you yesterday like okay. in the last class okay now like i said uh, yesterday um, ossn is a spectrum which ranges from the mildest form of dysplasia to invasive squamous cell carcinoma and it can be differentiated uh, or divided into two parts intraepithelial and invasive now intraepithelial means the lesion is confined to the epithelium now epithelium as we know has got multiple layers and arbitrarily we pathologists divide the epithelium into three parts the lower half lower one third middle one third and upper one third now if the dysplasia involves only the lower one third it is called mild dysplasia if it involves anything up to the middle one third it's called moderate dysplasia near full thickness that means barring the superficial one or two layers if rest of the epithelium is involved it is called severe dysplasia and when the entire thickness is involved but there is no invasive component then we call it carcinoma in situ when the epithelium goes or kind of buds just into the superficial stroma we call it a micro invasive squamous cell carcinoma or dysplasia with superficial invasion and then you have a full blown invasive carcinoma so uh, how do we differentiate the different types of histiocytosis subtypes based on histopathological examination okay well it's a long answer but let me try shortening it so xanthogranuloma uh, basically like i said it has got a chronic inflammatory background uh, it's a polymorphous background it has got those characteristic teuton giant cells and it has got those histiocytes that's very typical of a xanthogranuloma now necrobiotic gran uh, necro uh, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma will have necrobiosis in addition to what i just told you about a xanthogran lch lch is a malignant lesion now it has typically got those lang la uh, langerhans cells langerhans cells are basically histiocytes which have got those grooves 
and they are positive for a marker called CD1A. So when that marker comes positive in histiocytes, it's very typical of a LCH. But then for the four subtypes of histiocytosis, it's clinical and radiological co correlation that is important. But the basic morphology, light microscopy in all those benign histiocytosis is the same. It's only the malignant counterpart that has got a different histology. Okay, sir. Can I so, have a question? Yep. So if we do a special stain for uh, TB bacteria uh, and it comes out to be negative, like what is the percentage that it will come out positive in a TB PCR if we send the sample? Like okay. now, yeah, every case where PCR we are suspecting fresh. TB, huh. um, should sorry, we send sorry. TB PCR? Okay. Now, if you send a fresh sample, there is a good chance that you'll get a positivity if it is tuberculosis. Hmm. Okay. But if you put the specimen in formalin, we make a block out of it. The block can still be sent for TB PCR. Now, as opposed to ZN staining on the section, which has got a 30% positivity, a specificity only, only. So that means seven out of 10 times, I can miss it. Miss it. I mean, not I can miss it, but the <laughs> procedure makes me miss it. But if the piece, if I send it for a PCR, I mean, if I send the block, it increases the specificity, but there is nothing like sending a fresh specimen for PCR. Always preferable to send a fresh tissue, not the block. If we are suspecting a TB, uh, uh, to you also, we should be sending a fresh sample. No, not you can send it to me in formal. Formal, okay. Yes. It's just microbiology uh, testing, which also includes PCR, that needs fresh tissues. Otherwise, histopathologists are pretty okay sending you know, formal in. <laughs> we are quite adjustive. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, so features of Rosa Doffman disease. Okay. The most characteristic feature of Rosa Doffman disease is what we call empiripolysis. Okay. Again, uh, basically all these histiocytoses have a similar morphology. You see, you see histiocytes, you see a chronic inflammatory background. That's very typical of all histiocytoses. But empiripolysis is something that is classical to RDD. Empiripolysis means that you will have these large macrophages and you will see ingested native cells in it, native cells and native inflammatory cells. So you'll see a macrophage which is eating a plasma cell or which has engulfed a lymphocyte, which has engulfed a neutrophil. So that's called empiripolysis. Very typical of RDD. I have a rollover question. Yep. Kimura disease. Hmm. And uh, like we have had two cases where other, uh, like somewhere else the biopsy has been done and it has been reported as Kimura's, but the patient has like a yellow issue on the skin like okay. so we so we are suspecting aoxg like okay. adult onset xanthogranuloma one of the cases turned out to be aoxg although it was reported as kimuras and tomorrow we have another case posted which was reported as kimura somewhere else and we are still strongly suspecting aoxg and we're repeating the biopsy so what is this is there any relation is there any similarity in the uh, pathology there isn't any similarity in these two. Uh, but what Kimura's disease uh, is typically characterized by is this proliferation of vessels. Uh, and there is eosinophilia, tissue eosinophilia. Now, xanthogranuloma per se, it does have a lot of, it, it can have eosinophils, but the florid eosinophilia that we see in uh, Kimura's disease is missing. But yes, eosin, uh, Kimura's disease can be confused or has overlapping features with IgG4 related disease. And the cells in Kimura's disease can also be IgG4 positive. So those are two conditions which can have a histopathological overlap. But xanthogranuloma, no, xanthogranuloma has a very typical histopathology. So that's why Kimura's disease is also called angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. Mm -hmm. So angio, there's proliferation of blood vessels, lymphoid hyperplasia because there's chronic inflammation and eosinophilia. Yeah, so tomorrow another sample will come to you. Yep. <laughs> All right, any more questions, Subha? Uh, no, Shafali. 
So thank you so much, sir, for answering all our questions and for such an interesting uh, discussion. Today, it was Bollywood yeah. trivia. We yeah. were expecting more <laughs> Iron Man trivia. <laughs> so thank you, Shifali. Thank you, Subha and Raju. Thank, thank you so, you much, so much, sir. And uh, next, we'll meet on June 14th, which will be Essentials of Ophthalmic Microbiology by Dr. Mm -hmm. Lalita uh, Pranya. So see you on uh, June 14th. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Nice. Thank you so much.